And welcome to Safe Harbor Fellowship Baptist Church Sunday morning service. Hey, I uh, want to, before I get started, want to just uh, give you some information here. Uh, we will be assembling a church next Sunday, the 24th. I believe that's the right date. Anyway, we will be assembling a church for the first time in a couple of months, so I'm excited about that, looking forward to that. Uh, we will have Sunday school. And we will have a church service. There will be no evening service. And uh, then we will have a Wednesday evening service uh, there at the church. I will still be doing the, the videos like I'm doing now. But uh, Brother Terry will be doing the Wednesday evening service. Anyway, I just wanted to get that information out to you. And uh, for my church family, and for those of you who uh, don't attend the church but you watch the videos, uh, they will still be coming. We'll still be doing the same studies uh, that we've been doing. And uh, so I just uh, wanted to give you some information on what's going on. So, uh, yeah, if you're coming to church on Sunday, uh, bring your mask uh, because we will, we are still required to have masks. And uh, so and we'll be doing the social distancing, doing everything right as we should. Uh, trying to keep everybody safe and healthy. But anyway, uh, tonight, or this morning, I should say, uh, we're having our, uh, we're going to continue on in our study of Joshua. We're in chapter 11. We're going to be looking at verses 7 through 15. We're going to be talking about victory and complete obedience. So Joshua chapter 11, verses 7 through 15. Verse 7 says, So Joshua came and all the people of war with him against them by the waters of Maron. Suddenly, and they fell upon them. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of Israel, who smote them and chased them unto, the great, Zidon, unto great Zidon and unto Mesopotamim <laughs> and unto the valley of Mizpah eastward, and they smote them until they let, left them none remaining. And Joshua did unto them as the Lord bade him. He hewed their horses and burnt their chariots with fire. And Joshua at that time turned back and took Hazor and smote the king thereof with the sword, for Hazor before time was the head of all those kingdoms. Well, we talked about that over the last couple of weeks, about uh, Jabin, the king of Hazor. All right. Verse 11, And they smote all the souls that were therein with the edge of the sword, utterly destroying them. There was not any left to breathe, and he burnt Hazor with fire. And all the cities of those kings, and all the kings of them, did Joshua take, and smote them with the edge of the sword, and he utterly destroyed them, as Moses the servant of the Lord commanded. But as for the cities that stood still in their strength, Israel burned none of them, save Hazor only, that did Joshua burn. Verse 14, And all the spoil of these cities, and the cattle, and the children of the children of Israel took for a prey unto themselves. But every man they smote with the edge of the sword until they had destroyed them, neither left they any to breathe. Verse 15. As the Lord commanded Moses his servant, so did Moses command Joshua, and so did Joshua. He left nothing undone of all that the Lord commanded Moses. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do love you and we thank you for loving us. Father, I thank you for this, this book of Joshua, this passage of scripture that you've given us to look at this morning, Lord. And I pray, Father, that you would give me exactly the words, Lord, that you would have me to say. And Father, I pray that uh, Jesus Christ would be lifted up and glorified through everything that's said and everything that we do, Lord. And, and Father, I just want to now, Lord, just thank you for the, the privilege that we're going to have next Sunday, Lord, to be in your house. And, and Lord, I, I'm, I'm so excited about that. And I just thank you so much for that, Lord. But, but, Father, just now, Lord, as we're coming to your word now, Lord, just 
Just focus our hearts, focus our minds, Lord, and teach us from your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, the last, the last time we ended our study uh, in Joshua chapter 11, we looked at verses 1 to 6 and, and looked at overcoming fear and, and how that God has chosen us to be soldiers in His army and has given, <clears throat> excuse me, has given us the victory. We, we ended the study last time looking at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 to 5, and we saw that, that as a good soldier, that we need to endure hardness, and we need to not get entangled in the affairs of this life. Uh, we concluded with this premise from 2 Timothy 2 and verse 5, where it says, And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned, except... He strive lawfully. And, and remembering that God puts men in positions that He wants them for His purposes. So in Romans chapter 13, I want to just look at the first two verses of Romans chapter 13. Verse 1 says, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. So God puts the people in power that he wants in power to accomplish his purpose. We need to be obedient to the powers that God has put us under. As Christians, we are to follow the examples of Jesus and of the apostles. And when we talk about the apostles, we want to look especially at Paul because he was the apostle to the Gentile churches of which we are. So, here's Paul's instruction to us. We see it in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 16. 1 Corinthians 4 and 16. Paul says, Wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me. Then he restates his instructions more definitively in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And verse 1. So just a little bit further back there in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 1. He says, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. So Paul is saying to us, Be a follower of me, as I am a follower of Christ. Because Christ is the ultimate example. See, Paul was like me and, and, and like you. He was fallible. Jesus was perfect. So later, excuse me, later in his letter to the church at Philippi, he made it even more direct. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 17 through 19. Philippians chapter 3, verses 17 through 19. Where he says, Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. So we're to be followers of Paul as Paul is a follower of Christ. And as the pastor of the church, I'm to be a follower of Paul. The, the people of our church are to be followers of me as long as I'm following Paul and I'm following Christ. It's the way that is supposed to work. <clears throat> Look, it's not our place to rebel against the government. All right, there's been a lot of that going on lately. We've got this, 
this uh, the shutdown going on and the COVID nineteen pandemic and all the all the stuff that's going on and so we're getting a, a lot of of pushback and a lot of people that are are saying oh you got to do this and you got to do that and Second <clears throat> Corinthians chapter five and verse twenty says now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. See, our mission is to lead people into the kingdom of Christ, not to rebel against a government that we're really not a part of. Folks, we have to get this mindset in our heads and in our hearts. We're ambassadors for Christ. Our, our home is in heaven. We're here to win people to Christ, not to be involved in all the stupid stuff that's going on. God has called us out of rebellion and into obedience. Did you get that? God has called us as believers in Jesus Christ, has called us out of rebellion and into obedience. So why would you want to go back into what God has brought you out of? It doesn't make sense. Kind of sounds like the children of Israel wanting to go back into Egypt, doesn't it? Joshua had to deal with that. Moses had to deal with that. See, there are three key points that I want us to, to look at and to see from this passage of Scripture today. So the first thing that I want us to see is that Joshua dealt with the enemy suddenly. There was no hesitation. The second thing that I want us to see is that Joshua utterly destroyed the enemy and left none remaining. And the third point that I want us to see and to understand is that Joshua operated his mission in complete obedience to the command of God. So let's get started. Let's talk about dealing suddenly with the enemy. Joshua chapter 11 and verse 7. It says, So Joshua came, and all the people of war with him, against them by the waters of Merom, suddenly, and they fell upon them. When God told Joshua what to do, Joshua just went and did it. You know what? When God tells us what to do, we're just to do it. See, when, when God reveals your enemy, which is the sin in your life, do not hesitate to deal with it. That's what this is a picture of for us. Uh, just as all these armies were surrounding Israel and had to be dealt with quickly and harshly, your sin and my sin will keep growing and multiplying until we deal with it. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 11, the Bible says, Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Verse 12 says, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Look folks, when God, when God reveals to you that you have something in your life that you need to deal with, deal with it. Now, quickly and harshly. Get it out of your life. That's how you overcome it. See, point number two is your enemy must be utterly destroyed. We're going to look at verses 8 through 14. See, Joshua destroyed everything that came up against him. Verse 8. 
says there in verse 8, to the end of the verse, until they left them, none remaining. None remaining. Took care of all that sin. Verse 11 and verse 14. Look at, look at verse 11. And they smote <clears throat> all the souls of them that were, that were therein with the edge of the sword, utterly destroying them. Look at this next phrase. There was not left, there was not any left to breathe. And he burnt Hazor with fire. Verse 14. At the end of the verse of verse 14, it says, Neither left they any to breathe. See, to deal with sin, you must utterly destroy it. Verse 11 again. We just read it. It, say, it says the same thing. And, and, and they, uh, they smote all the souls that were therein with the edge of the sword, utterly destroying them. Verse 12. And all the cities of those kings and all the kings of them did Joshua take and smote them with the edge of the sword and he utterly destroyed them. Verse 14. Is, we just read it also. It says, And all the spoil of these cities and the cattle and the children, the children of Israel took for a prey unto themselves, but every man they smote with the edge of the sword until they had destroyed them. Then we see in verses 11 and again in verse 13 that they burnt Hazor with fire. See, Hazor was the principal city Hazor was the seat of the sin. Remember in our study before, we said we, I told you that Hazor meant castle. It's what, it's what is the stronghold. What is the stronghold in your life? What is the one thing that you have repeatedly tried to get past that keeps harassing you? See, See, our minds, our minds are the battlefield. And, and God wants us to think like Him. And God wants us, if we think like Him, we'll act like Him. But our enemy wants us to think like Him. So that we'll act like Him. So that's what the battle is. It, it's for the mind. So when you have something in your mind, something that just keeps coming up and keeps cropping up, you have to deal with it. And you can't just say, well... Okay, okay, I, this is a trouble. I'm just not going to do this anymore. It doesn't work like that. You have to burn it up. You have to utterly destroy it. You have to leave no breath in it. You cannot let a seed of it remain. Or it will come back. And it will come back stronger. That's your Hazor. Romans 6 deals with this for the whole chapter of Romans 6. Now, I, <clears throat> I'm not going to do that to you, but what I want to do is give you a few verses. But folks, I, I am strongly encouraging you to read and to study this chapter carefully for yourselves. Take your time. Read it. Reread it. Study it. Pray about it. And apply it in your life. I want to look at just a few verses. Romans chapter 6 and verse 6 says, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that him would be Christ, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Verse 13, Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. You see how it works? <clears throat> you got to take it away from the old man and bring it into the new man. Take it away from the things of the world and the things of your adversary and bring them into the things of God, thinking like God and acting like God. Verse 14, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, 
but under grace. Verse 22, But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. So you see, once you have utterly destroyed that enemy, but once you've taken your life from serving the flesh and serving the world and serving Satan to serving God, you have the ability to utterly destroy any sin that can come up in your life. And that's what you need to do. That's what I need to do. Now folks, just because, just because you defeat a sin in your life today, doesn't mean you're not going to have something else crop up tomorrow. I promise you, you will. As long as we're in this flesh, as long as we're in this world, we're going to have to fight the battle. The victory is won. The war is won. But the victory is in winning it every day. <clears throat> so let's talk about how to operate your life in complete obedience. To operate your life in complete obedience. I want to read three verses from Joshua chapter 11. Verse 9, 12, and 15. <clears throat> Joshua chapter 11 and verse 9. And Joshua did unto them as the Lord bade him, he hewed their horses and burnt their chariots with fire. See, God requires obedience in your relationship. So, verse 9 says that He hewed, which means to cut the hamstrings of their horses, and He burnt their chariots. See, He removed their strength. <clears throat> Not only do you and I have to get the sin out of our lives, we have to remove its strength from our lives. What is it? What is it that keeps pulling you back into your sin? Whatever it is, it must be dealt with no matter what the pain level is. Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 and 8 says this. Galatians 6, 7 and 8. It says, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Verse 8 says, For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Look. If you won't deal with it, whatever it is, on your own, God will deal with it for you. From what I understand of the scripture, it's better if you do it for yourself. In the power of God, the Holy Spirit of God, and the Word of God. Back in Joshua chapter 11 and verse 12, it says that all the cities of those kings and all the kings of them, of them did Joshua take and smote them with the edge of the sword and he utterly destroyed them as Moses the servant of the Lord commanded. See, verse 12 shows us that your enemy is never defeated. Your sin is never overcome. Listen, if you allow any aspect of it to remain in your life. Sometimes you find your, yourself involved in one way or another with toxic people. You know what I'm talking about. Toxic people who constantly keep you pulled down who constantly keep uproar in your life, confusion in your life, 
trial and tribulation in your life. The only way to overcome it, the only way to overcome the drag is to totally eradicate them from your life. You have to get them away from you. If you don't, they will be a continual hindrance to your relationship with God. Romans chapter 16 and verse 17 says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. If you have a toxic person, or maybe you have toxic people in your life, you have to get away from them. Let's look at verse 15, Joshua chapter 11. As the Lord commanded Moses his servant, so did Moses command Joshua. And so did Joshua. He left nothing undone of all that the Lord commanded Moses. Leave nothing undone. Let me tell you why. See, your adversary looks for your weakness to attack you. Listen to the words of 1 Peter chapter 5. Verses 8 and 9. First Peter chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Verse 9 says, Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren, that are in the world. Look, we're going to go through the same things as the people in the world. But we have to go through them in the power of the Holy Spirit, in the power of Christ, in the Word of God as our strength and our, and, and our fortress. If we don't, our adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, is walking about seeking to devour us. He cannot devour us if we don't give him the latitude that he needs to work in. If you leave nothing undone of the things that God commands you, <clears throat> then you give no place to your adversary. Romans chapter 13 and verse 14 says, But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. See, so the reason that most of us have most of the problems that we have is because that we don't completely put on the Lord Jesus Christ and not make provision for the flesh. Oh, we want to be like Jesus. We want to be Christian. We want to look like Christians, act like Christians, and smell like Christians, but we still want to keep one foot in the world. You can't do it and be a successful Christian. The verse says, But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Leave nothing undone of that which the Lord commands you. <clears throat> so I, I want to, I wanna, in closing, I want to try to pull this together for us so that we can have a clear picture through the example of our Joshua. Now I, wanna, I, wanna, I want you to take your Bibles and go to Acts chapter 7 and verse 45. Acts chapter 7 and verse 45. Acts chapter 7 and verse 45, the Bible says, Which also our fathers that came after, now watch this, brought in with Jesus 
into the possession of the Gentiles, whom God drave out before the face of our fathers unto the days of David. You see Jesus there in that verse? That is the Greek name. Speaking here of Joshua, obviously, because Joshua is the one, right? We've been reading that, that brought in the children of Israel into the possession of the Gentiles. But in Acts 7 and 45, it says Jesus. See, Jesus is the Greek name. Joshua is the Hebrew. So the Joshua, now stay with me, the Joshua that we are studying is a picture or a type, if you will, of our Jesus. See, so in Joshua 11 and verse 15, he shows us the perfect obedience that God desires for you and me. He pictures for us what Jesus fulfills for us. Now, as we have came through the book of Joshua, we've seen that obviously he's a type and a picture, and a type and a picture always breaks down in the Bible. But he's, he's a very significant type of Christ. But he wasn't Christ because he did things that violated the Word of God. Christ never did. But I want you to see this picture. Joshua pictures what Jesus fulfills. In Psalm 11 and verse 4, the Bible says the Lord is in His holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, His eyelids try the children of men. So Jesus, here in, in, in Psalm 11 and 4, the Lord is in His holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. But look at what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, I mean chapter 8 and verse 9. It says, For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, yet for your sakes He became poor, that ye through His poverty might be rich. So, so Jesus left His throne in heaven and came to earth for you and me. Why? Because without Him, we had no hope. But that's just the beginning of the story. The story of obedience. Say in Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, the Bible says, Who being, speaking of Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man. Now look, that, that was not an easy task. To, to give up his, his position in heaven on the throne and come to earth and take on the form of a man was not an easy task. But it got harder. But praise God, Jesus left nothing undone. Look at Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. Look at verses 41 through 44. It says that He was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast, and he kneeled down and prayed. Now, in Luke 21 here, in, in this passage of Scripture, we're looking at Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, the night that he was betrayed. We're talking about when he goes to the Garden to pray and to talk to his Father. And so in verse 41, it says, And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast, and kneeled down and prayed, saying, watch this, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. Verse 44. 
and being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. My friends, leaving nothing undone does not come without a cost. Jesus Christ paid an awful cost. Philippians 2 and verse 8 says, And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Say, so Jesus was obedient to suffer the most agonizing death imaginable for people that hated him. And we won't even talk to somebody because they look different to us or smell different to us. But we call ourselves Christians. Hebrews 12.2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the, <clears throat> excuse me, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. That's our example. That's our example. Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. See, there is a tremendous cost, but there is also tremendous reward. Revelation 3 and verse 21 says, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and am set down with my Father in his throne. Look, folks. That is to the church of the Laodiceans. That is to us. We're the church of the Laodiceans. We're the church that thinks we're enriched with goods and have need of nothing. And Jesus tells us that we don't even know that we're blind and naked and destitute. But he tells us, he tells us, to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and have sat down with my Father in his throne. We're called to be like Joshua. We're called to be like Jesus, leaving nothing undone. So the question from the pulpit this morning is, how you doing? How are you doing? Hebrews chapter 12, and I'm going to close with this. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 3 and 4, says, For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Listen to verse 4 closely. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Folks, if you're listening to this message, you're watching this video, listening to this video, however you're getting this message, the first act of obedience that we're called to do is to accept the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ as our own. Asking Him to be our Savior to come into our hearts and to save us, to repent of our sins and walk after Him. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 10 and verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Verse 10 says, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Verse 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That is your first act of obedience. If you've never done that, do it now.
Do it now. Don't wait. Don't leave anything undone. Christian, how are you dealing with it? How are you dealing with your life? Are you leaving something undone? You have the Holy Spirit of God in you. You have the Word of God before you. You have no excuse. I don't know what else to say. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do love you. Father, we thank you for loving us. Lord, I thank you for this message from Joshua. What a powerful message. And Father, I pray that, Lord, the people that hear this would receive it with the love that it was given. And Father, with the, with the compassion, and with the desire to see people to live and to walk and to be like Jesus. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would move in people's hearts and in people's lives and empower them, Lord, to overcome the sin that does so easily beset us. Father, help us to walk in your steps, to walk in your light, and to be examples of the Lord Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.